All right, everybody. Welcome back to Philosophy for all the people. And we are here again with the good doctor, Dr. Jim Madden, beginning Sir. a new series. We've got like three or four series going on right now, but hey, this is uh this is for the people, and we're pumped. We're gonna we're gonna work through Wilhelm Gottfried Leibniz's on the ultimate origination of things. And um this is going to be cool. This is going to yes, be cool is. because uh, we're both fans of Leibniz. Jim, you did your your PhD was on Leibniz. Was that yep. right? Yeah. Give yep. us a little background, by the way, of your how yeah, you first so, got friendly with the monads. If you will. How did I get friendly with the monads? So, mm -hmm. um, I uh, I arrived at Purdue uh, the fall of 1998, and um, you know was given basically given three courses to take uh, that semester. I took um, Jan Cover's uh, general graduate course on Leibniz. Uh, I took, he's, got, he's got a book on Leibniz and freedom, doesn't he? Yeah, he's he's got, he, I think he's got a couple books now. Jan, Jan Cover is like, I think one of the hidden gems in American philosophy. Uh, I, that, he's a, just an incredible, great guy and uh, an interesting individual, right? Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, and so I, I, I had Cover's uh, sort of general grad course on Leibniz. And that same semester, I had Bill Rose uh, seminar on metaphysics, and I had a course in uh, meta proof theory and logic. Right, so I, my first semester, I got thrown in the deep end of of the pool. Right? Pretty like, bold, boom. man. That's yeah, that, yeah, that yeah was, that's sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I remember uh, you know, so Cover, um, and actually, you know, we're I mentioned this earlier to you privately. Here it is, man. This was the this was the the textbook that we used in that class for for uh, Cover's seminar. Man, I still think if, if somebody wants a good collection of uh, Leibniz stuff, the area of Garber philosophical essays from Hackett uh, is, is still the best one. And uh, I remember, um, you know, Cover just, uh, I mean, we just basically opened up the book and, and just started reading it. Right. And we worked really closely through Leibniz's discourse on metaphysics and the sex or excerpts from the, the, uh, Correspondence to Arnaud, that was like the main focus. I think it actually was on the discourse, the actual seminar. And um, that was the first time I had really done serious, uh, like, like metaphysics in that sense. And, you know, my undergrad, that sort of thing wasn't done very much. And, and it can say that wasn't done very much. And it blew me away, absolutely blew me away. Um, and then encountering things like Leibniz's cosmological argument deeply uh you know complicated things for me theologically and keep in mind i'm having another class with bill Rowe at the same time right anyway so uh by the end of and then the second semester i had another seminar from cover on um causation in leibniz mm -hmm. and so by the end of that second semester i'm pretty much planning to do my dissertation under cover uh, on leibniz and then eventually go on to do my dissertation on leibniz and teleology mm -hmm. and it had one of the the, the virtue that no one that we could find had done a dissertation on Leibniz and teleology. But then once I got into it, there was like very good reason for that because there's, there's, there's not much to say, but that you wish <laughs> they had teleology he insists on having it. Right. And so mm -hmm. I ended up having to backtrack stuff in the medieval sources uh, mm -hmm. to make sense of it. And that's how I got into Aquinas. Right. Nice. Is, yeah. And so the dissertation ended up being uh, on Leibniz and the fifth way. Okay. And oh, I basically, yeah. Yeah. So I basically argued that you either had to like go in for a kind of Humean skepticism or you had to either go with like Leibnizian panpsychism or uh, Thomistic theism uh, mm -hmm. to make sense of causation. Right. That, that was that was the, that was the dissertation. Yeah. Is that dissertation ever going to become a book? I don't know. I mean, it's it is it has now sat in my desk drawer for 20 years. Uh, so I, I published a couple of papers out of it. Um, mm -hmm. But. Uh, I've never really thought about publishing the whole thing. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I'll return to it at some point here and, yeah. and, and go back through all that. Yeah, but that that was it. Um, but I, you know, early on, like some of early stuff I published was on the fifth way that came out of dissertation. I published yeah. some stuff early on about Leibniz on miracles that came out of dissertation. So a lot of yeah. like the significant stuff. There's this just massive chapter in there on uh, teleology mm -hmm. in Aristotle. And contemporary theories of intentionality, uh, yeah. which is like, it's like this. I mean, it's man, it it it's like a sixty-page pa paper 
on and where I've like come up with a version of the predicate calculus to like accommodate uh, Aristotle's t- teleology. I don't, know, I don't know that anybody knows what's going on in that thing, but me. But, <laughs> that sounds, but, <laughs> that sounds very contortionist. <laughs> yeah, it really was. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if the thing is publishable, but man, it was a fun trip. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, man, that's that's awesome. All right, so what we're going to do for this series, by the way, if, if you're not familiar with this work on the ultimate origination of things, uh, yeah. it was published in 1697, yeah. right? Is that yeah. is that when it was? Yeah. Um, and so I kind of situates it a little bit historically, and we'll talk. I'll have Jim talk about Leibniz as as the uh, as a character here in just a minute. Yeah. Uh, but this will give you an idea of sort of Leibniz's. It's it it serves two purpose purposes. One, it, it gives an argument for God. Uh, really, this is sort of, I guess, in many ways, the grandfather of contingency arguments. I think that might yeah. be fair to say. Yeah. Right now, now people say, look, contingency arguments go much further back than Leibniz, and in a sense, they do, yeah, right? But, they do. but, but they also kind of do start with Leibniz as well, right? Yeah. This is sort of the first one where somebody explicitly has in mind possible world semantics in the background and stuff. Yeah. Co- correct, right? Yeah. And uh, so, so we'll see that in here, and then we also get. Uh, his very interesting theodicy, right? So he gives an argument yeah. for God, then he gives a defense of God in the face of the problem of evil. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it is an important work. It's a fascinating work, and I'm excited to begin exploring it. Jim, uh, before we start reading this, and, and gentle listeners, we are just going to read this and, and comment. So we're going to be engaging directly with the text here because it's short enough to do that. Uh, before we dive in, Jim, anything by way of background that you think people should know about Leibniz? Who sure. was this guy? I mean... Pretty yeah. impressive dude, right? I mean, he was a yeah. legit polymath. Uh, give us a little legit. historical context, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Leibniz uh, was actually trained as a as a lawyer and an engineer, um, and never held the university post. Like most good philosophers, never really like most major philosophers, never held university post. Uh, he would he you know he he made his living uh, through patronage and basically doing contract work as an engineer. Right. There's some pretty some pretty famous engineering projects that he was behind in the uh, in in the 17th 18th century, and and um, in his earliest writings, so all throughout his whole career, his uh, vision was a reunification of the churches. I mean, that was really his thing. Is that he wanted he wanted to get the Christian band back together, right? Like he wanted he, like the, it was a scandal to him that Christianity was divided. Mm-hmm. And um, he actually was at one point offered uh, the Vatican librarianship and turned it down uh, because he just he's like, I'm, I, I, I can't actually do that. I can't go there and work because I'm not a Catholic. And it pained him that there was this division. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, so he had this view ultimately that like, there was a possibility of this kind of like rationally grounded Christian cosmopolis that that if he just got things right philosophically, it could all be put back together. Right. So his early Which is his, not yeah, radically, dis, you know, far from Descartes' kind of hopes. You know what I mean? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And and so he he early in his career, he um, was basically a Cartesian, like a straightforward Cartesian. Wrote some very interesting early papers on Eucharist. Uh, mm-hmm. He had basically a scotistic position on the Eucharist. Um, and at one point, I think he I, can't, I think he actually went and had a meeting with Spinoza. Right? He met. I think he met. If I remember right, he met Spinoza. A profoundly moving experience for him. And in a lot of ways, the rest of his career is kind of a debate with Spinoza. It's like, kind of, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh-huh. and because so what you have in Spinoza was this. I mean, you know, Spinoza. I mean, I think you know he's not he's not an atheist, right? Uh, that all that's overstated. I think so. He he has he has. Oh, this no, he, he's he's a very quirky type of theist. Yeah, yeah, and he has this view about needing God to ground the uh, contingent world. Mm-hmm. But what happens with Spinoza? Is we lose the world in the process, okay, mm-hmm. or in, in an uncharitable read. And so, like Leibniz is worried about that. So, a lot of ways, you could look at, and this would be important, I think, in interpreting what's going to go on in the text we're reading, um, to see Leibniz as trying to have his Spinoza without, like, like without losing the world, right, mm-hmm. and 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 maintaining freedom and maintaining contingency, all these things that Spinoza seems to lose, seems to lose. I mean, you know, there's more to be said about Spinoza. Anyway, and so. Um, you know, I, we generally his work, Leibniz's work is is divided into three periods: the early period, right, basically the Cartesian period, um, and and then the middle period, which is mainly associated with uh, the discourse on metaphysics, the correspondence with Arnaud, um, 
which by the way, if anyone wants to read one of the great philosophical B team guys in history, Arnaud is the guy. Leibniz corresponds with him. Descartes corresponds with him. He's he's the behind the scenes guy for everybody. A lot of a lot of we should do an episode on like the best great B teamers. teamers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah great, man, great, that's a good idea. Great, 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 great B teamers in philosophy. Yeah, my, my really? vote is Arnaud. Right? Mm -hmm. Um. Anyway, and so, uh, and then and then then you have the later period, which is associated with the monadology, um, and some of the like the more let's just like hardcore idealist texts mm -hmm. by, by Leibniz. Okay. And so the early, early stuff, he's more or less kind of a Cartesian dualist. Uh, in the middle period, um, you know, he's something different. It's hard to characterize what it is. We'll talk about that. And then the late period, he's gone all the way over into a kind of idealism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what, what ultimate origination things is, is as, as 1697, it's late, middle or early, late. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the interesting things about Leibniz is um, he really, okay, so he, Everything he does ends up in the same place, and we'll talk about that. But he he begins it from different positions. Okay, so one of his very very important early papers, uh, primary truths, or sometimes called first truths, he he basically spins the whole Leibnizian system, mm -hmm. beginning with logical considerations. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and some places he'll like spin he'll he'll begin with an ontological argument for God's existence, and then spin the entire system out of the divine nature. Okay. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he'll begin with the contingency of the world and spin the whole system out of that. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. In all these cases, the thing in the background is the principle of sufficient reason. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. And so basically, I think one of the things that we can take from Leibniz is if you have the principle of sufficient reason in your toolbox, right, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you start from, you're going to end up with the same basic set of metaphysical truths. Right. Right. Yeah. Just, that's a good insight. His career is just, it's just running it from all these different directions. Right. Right. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So. That's yeah, that's what, that. Yeah. That's that's awesome. So let me say just a, a few other uh, things uh, before we dive into the text here. Is first off, you know, the Leibnizian tradition is alive and well today in oh, metaphysics yeah. and philosophy of religion. I mean, there's there's so many great Leibnizians out there, or people who are like very sympathetic to to Leibniz that I've benefited from a yeah. lot. I mean, Proust comes to mind. Even yourself. I know you say yeah. you're kind of recovering from your light nipsey and hangover yeah, but my, my <laughs> uh, recovery is maybe overstated at times right? or, you know yeah, other thinkers yeah. like kenny pierce and Proust is interesting because he really has continued the tradition is he somebody who's like at the at, right right at the edge of the debate in terms of contemporary contingency arguments and ontological arguments right he's, yeah. he's out there pushing the the sort of modal possible cause arguments and yeah. now there's formulations interesting enough there's formulations that even allow for brute facts that yeah. still go through, which say, hey, maybe we don't even need the PSR yeah. to run the ontological argument anymore. So yeah. just kind of like I, an interesting I, development I think, there. I think most contemporary analytic philosophers of religion and a lot of metaphysicians are Leibnizians of some description or other. Sure. Right? And even take like a Roderick Chisholm or someone like that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. th there's deep influence by Leibniz there, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and you know, um, you know, one more thing about Leibniz too, I should mention. Okay, you know, he did invent the calculus. Now, I think it, it sounds like that little side and, project. Yeah, side project. He and Newton, uh, it seemed that they arrived at it almost simultaneously without any influence between the two of them. Okay, and interesting thing is, but the notation that that mostly is used in teaching calculus today, the al algebraic notation for it, is basically Leibniz's. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe more impressive on Newton's part, New Newton did calculus without algebra. Mm -hmm. Without without symbolism. So if you ever go through Principia, and I've I've attempted to do it, mm -hmm. he does all the proofs in the calculus in English prose. Right. Mm -hmm. That is that man. That is a that is a real man at work there. Right? <laughs> that is yeah. a real man, dude. It's <laughs> a real man. There, right? Yeah. But, Anyway, yeah, so I should mention the calculus with Leibniz, too. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So Guy was undoubtedly a genius, a polymath, yeah. Uh, yeah. and his work is really worth engaging with. And we're going to do that right yeah. now so let's pull yeah. it up and what we're going to do is we're just going to read and comment read and comment yeah. read and comment have some fun if you guys have um questions or comments on your own please put them in we'll try and do some q a yeah. uh towards the end of, of each of these so uh what do you want jim you want me to just start do here? you mind to read because like uh, in all honesty my dyslexia will come out pretty strong no that's that, dude, yeah. that's totally fine man all right um by the way you can find this free online uh but jim gave me this translation this is the jim madden approved translation so this yeah. is the one that, that we're using and, here 
and in fairness to any copyright lawyers, we are encouraging everyone to buy a copy of the Erie Evan Garber from Hackett, uh, where this where the, where this was found. Right. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. All right. So here we go on the ultimate origination of things. Leibniz writes beyond the world. That is, beyond the collection of finite things, there is some one being who rules, not only as the soul is the ruler in me, or better, as the self is the ruler in my body, but also in a much higher sense. For the one being who rules the universe not only rules the world, but also fashions or creates it. He is above the world, and so to speak, extra mundane, and therefore he is the ultimate reason for things." For we cannot find in any of the individual things or even in the entire collection and series of things a sufficient reason for why they exist. Let us suppose that a book on the elements of geometry has always existed, one copy always made from another. It is obvious that although we can explain a present copy of the book from the previous book from which it was copied, this will never lead us to a complete explanation, no matter how many books back we go, since we can always wonder why there have always been such books why these books were written and why they were written the way they were. Let's pause there, Jim, because that's a that's a whole heck of a lot. Sure. From yeah, the a lot right there. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Right. Yeah, so, so much uh, we can go with there. Yeah. Go for right. it. Right. So 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 already like we're seeing the the PSR is implicitly at work, right? Yeah. Um, we yeah. don't have an explicit formulation of it, but we can see it's it's there. And the and the idea of the PSR is like, look, whatever exists has an adequate, sufficient explanation for its existence. That's that's at least a PSR that's formulated around the existence of contingent things. And that's something that Thomists are very friendly with. Of course, there, there's other formulations of the PSR that, that are that are broader than that, right? They yep. just want to explain facts in general, which might extend to actions and stuff like that. I don't know if we need to get into that there, but he's at least right now, but he's committed to the idea uh, that – that, that reality is intelligible, right? That, that's fundamentally what the PSR comes down to is that yeah. reality is fundamentally intelligible, uh, that things uh, can be adequately, sufficiently explained. Now, right away, the, the, the thing here that he's, that he's kind of picking out are certain categories of things that seem to always point out beyond themselves for an explanation. He says finite things, individual things, and importantly, this is important, entire collections and series yep. of things, right? And immediately he's he's already like hedging off what is still arguably probably one of the most persistent objections to these types of first cause arguments, right? Which is the infinite regress objection, right? Right. And and so for people who aren't familiar with contingency arguments, they essentially they essentially go like this, right? They'll essentially say, look, there are contingent things, things that do not carry within themselves the reason for existence, uh, for their existence. And these things always point beyond themselves uh, for the reason why they're included in reality rather than not. Now, in order to make sense of all contingent things collectively, say like just why there are any things of the type contingent at all, we're going to have to ex like transcend that category, right? We're going to have to get to some, some necessary thing, right? Right. And then... Um, Somebody will respond and say, well, well, hold on a minute. Well, can, can, maybe just one contingent thing can be explained by some prior contingent thing, can be explained by some prior contingent thing, by some prior contingent thing, and so on and so forth, you know, ad infinitum. And Leibniz is just saying, no, look, guys, that's bullshit, right? Right. <laughs> just like straight up here. And he gives the example of the uh, geometry books here, which I assume would have been Euclid's geometry. That's probably what he would have been studying at the time, right? Um, and saying, look, even, even if... We can explain one of these geometry books by one copied from one before it, and so on and so on, uh, to in, you know to infinity and beyond. Pull the Buzz Lightyear there. Right. Uh, clearly, that isn't a satisfactory explanation because it doesn't explain why there are any of these books in the first place. And and the yeah. one thing I want to say here, Jim, before I let you hop in, is Leibniz is not only definitely right, but the fundamental problem I think he's pointing out here about the infinite regress objection is that. It, it, it actually presupposes part of the fact in question, right? So you can't possibly give an explanation of some fact, certainly not an extrinsically causal explanation of some fact, by way of something that's included in that fact, right? That's right. obviously viciously circular. So if I say, take the example of, of phoenixes, right? There's a phoenix, and that phoenix is explained by the prior phoenix that died, and from its ashes came the other phoenix. And then that phoenix was explained by some prior phoenix that died, and from the ashes came that phoenix, right? To ask, well, why are there any phoenixes at all? And to get a response 
that, oh, it's because of some prior Phoenix already assumes that there are Phoenixes, right? right. <laughs> it presupposes the fact that stands in need of an explanation. So it could never possibly be anything aside from a, a very circular um, and, and horribly inadequate explanation in that sense. I think these illustrations really help to, to draw yeah. that out. At best, we could say maybe it's a local explanation, but it's not a global explanation. And right. what we're looking for is a global explanation. So, yeah, I just I, I want to spend some time on this because because, as you know, Jim, this is like the persistent objection and liveness is coming right out for it right. at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. You know, a, a couple of things, you know, uh, uh, like 100 percent on all that, uh, a couple of things on the text. So if you look at. Um, you know, he starts out and he, and he says, you know, that, you know, beyond the world uh, that is beyond the collection of finite things, there is some one being who rules not only as the soul is the ruler in me or better as the soul is the ruler in my body, but also in a much higher sense for the one being who rules over the universe, not only rules, rules the world, but also fashions or creates it. Uh, he is above the world and so to speak, extra mundane. And therefore he is the ultimate reason for things. Okay. Um, it, it's actually, he's, he's hinting at different kinds of explanation in those opening lines. All right. And, and for me, kind of the canonical line in Leibniz is in the discourse on metaphysics where he actually refers us to Plato's Phaedo, right? And, and, he, and he refers us to the moment in Plato's Phaedo where Socrates was talking about in his youth, uh, he used to be into natural scientific explanations, but he felt like natural scientific explanations didn't really tell him why, okay? And, and he said, you know, this Anaxagoras guy said he's gonna give you an explanation in terms of mind, okay? And, um, but then he didn't, he just gave me an explanation in terms of, of natural properties of things. And then Socrates says, the only thing that would satisfy me would be an explanation in terms of mind. And then when he glosses what that means, he says, thing, the only kind of explanation would, would, that really would satisfy us would be one that accounted for the world in terms of its being the best. Okay. Uh, and so what Socrates is hinting at in the Phaedo is the idea that ultimately we don't have complete intelligibility unless we have a moral explanation of the world yeah mm -hmm. all right and and that's going to be very important in this text i think very very important in this text so leibniz is saying here is well many many, many things are going on he's saying like one god uh rules the universe or he, he's going to argue that there's a god that rules the universe not just in the sense that he pushes it around the way a cartesian mind pushes it around a cartesian body though i'm not endorsing that uh Okay, <laughs> it's not just like rule as in as in can make stuff happen within it rules in the sense that creates it. OK, mm -hmm. and is the ultimate reason for it, meaning reason in all the senses of reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's it, it's reason in the sense of creation, but it's also reason in the sense of um, it provides the moral explanation for it, too. Right. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, mm -hmm. which is really, really important for Leibniz. OK, yeah. and as we're going to see this. All right. Another thing to note here is, okay, for a long time, I like, it's such a weird example. Like, okay, let's suppose the world is just, a, is at any one moment is just a finite set of geometry books tasked with creating the next gen generation of geometry books. Okay. It's a very weird example. Like why, you I mean, why not, why not teddy bears then? Right. Okay. Right. And I think the geometry book thing is to say that, that you could look at all these geometry books and you could see a set of absolute a priori necessary laws, right? That explains all the happenings within all the books. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you would have a natural law, you know, like in Leibniz's sense, like, like a, an a priori physical explanation of mm -hmm. everything going on in the universe. Right. Um, but that would not provide this ultimate explanation that Leibniz is looking for. D do you see that? Right. And so, yes, and I think it's a very important point in like understanding like like what what this argument is intended to do and why people miss the point of this is yeah that's very good uh -huh. yeah he's he's granting let's just suppose because he I mean Leibniz is all into completed physics like he thinks it's just a matter of time and we got it right mm -hmm, okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, like all the early like your all your early rationalists right 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 um, he's like let's suppose we got the completed physics and like, what is what is the calculus the well, the calculus is is temporal geometry right it's dynamic geometry geometry of change let's suppose we've got a complete we, we know the book we know the book that reproduces itself and everything the book of nature the book of the 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 the, the mathematics of nature okay 
and we could see that inscribed in the bean of every natural object okay but that doesn't tell us why there are any books at all yes right, right. it mm -hmm. just gives us the nature of the books we have mm -hmm. and it may explain the the arising of one generation of them from the other but mm -hmm. it doesn't explain why there are books at all and it doesn't explain so the, and we're going to see them in the next sentences here divide the question there's a question of why are there geometry books at all and why do they have the nature that they have yes right, right? yeah good 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 you see that okay and yeah. these are in an ultimate explanation would answer both those questions right 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 and right the first question we'll see Leibniz thinks is going to have to be answered by a metaphysical explanation. Yep. And the second one will have to be answered by a moral explanation. Yes. Yeah. Really good. Really good setup, Jim. Really good right. distinctions as well. I want to just highlight a few of those p parts is yeah. this is this is again, this is like we were saying it behind the scenes. Like, look, there's been a lot of advancement in contemporary philosophy of religion on contingency arguments and stuff like that. I was just revisiting Proust on some of this stuff, but like, man, I just, like, I think Leibniz is right. Like, I, I think he, like, I think his argument at the end of the day is a good argument. And, um, I think that like understanding this text, I think can still go a long way to alleviating, if not obliterating so many of the modern objections when you properly understand yeah. what, what Leibniz yeah. is after. And you've already highlighted some of those. Um, one is that, even if you're committed to a certain view of necessity, um, even if you thought that certain aspects of this world were physically or even metaphysically necessary, that doesn't exempt you automatically of a need for a deeper explanation, right? Like if, if I look up in the, in the night sky and the stars are so arranged to say that God sent this message, right? Um, maybe you could show me that, that there was some sort of necessity behind why that had to be the case. The stars yeah. had to be, but that would, but it's so epistemic, this hypothetical necessity, right? It's so epistemically improbable that it would still look for a deeper explanation of that necessity. Yeah. You yeah. see that, right? So well, just, yeah. just discovering or calling yeah. something necessary is kind of, it doesn't do much in terms yeah. of actually offering an adequate, complete explanation. I think this is such a cop out that so many people take cough naturalist cough, right? Just like yeah. just sprinkling on the words necessity or something, right? Yeah. That ain't going to help you here, guys. Like, it, and it's interesting, you know, Leibniz, man, I'm like having dissertation flashbacks here. Yeah. <laughs> is, is, you know, Leibniz lifts this from Aristotle's physics, where, you know, Aristotle talks about, you know, you can, we can talk about absolute versus hypothetical necessity. And, and, and you know, given the natures of things that are are, it follows necessarily uh, that that certain things are going to happen, but that's not to say that those things are absolutely necessary. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think this is, and he'll say it, I, I can't remember if it's necessary or not, but Leibniz does use this exact language. He'll say, yeah, it's hypothetically necessary given this current generation of geometry books, the next one will have the same geometry. Right. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't tell us it was necessary that there be geometry books in the first place. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think, you know, the, the, like the, I think the interesting objection to this, you'll find it, in Hume, right, you find it elsewhere, is that, okay, look, um, what more do we need if every geometry book has an explanation, right, in a prior geometry book? What more do we need for an explanation of the whole, but the explanation of all the parts, right? Mm -hmm. And in each one of these cases, right, you would have an explanation for each part, the prior geometry book, okay? And um, so what more do you need? Like, why do we have to go outside of the series for an explanation, okay? Um, and of course, there's a, there's a massive literature on this question, right? There's a massive literature on this question. Somebody just addressed that in a recent article. Exactly, exactly. And my my favorite playing out of this debate, obviously, given my history, is there's a great debate between Bill Rowe and Bruce Reichenbach on this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Reichenbach makes the claim that, look, uh, if every member of a series is contingent, then the series is contingent because it's always possible that they all might not have existed, Right. Right. Right, you right, see right. that? So it seems like like he's going to say that you can go park the whole like we look all the bricks are solid, therefore the wall is solid. That's fine. Like sometimes part the whole reasoning is okay depending on the attributes we're talking. That's about. That's right. If the, if the property yeah. is diffusive, that's the yeah. question. Is the property diffusive? Um, right. Mm -hmm. And then and then Rose' reply to this is basically, well, look, uh, you know, it seems like for all we know, it's a necessary truth that some contingent beings exist at all. Okay it's necessary that there is some contingency like he doesn't see an argument against that. Right. Um, and I agree. I don't, I can't prove that it's, that it's not necessary that there's some contingency. Okay. But we're, we're going for all we know there now. Right. And, and it seems like, you know, now, I mean, it, that's not, 
um, okay, for all we know, lots of things, but it does seem intuitive, this, intuitive to me that all the things in the world might fail to exist simultaneously, and thereby that shows the world is contingent, and thereby needs an explanation that it exists, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And moreover, even if you like granted real that point, right, that, okay, it's necessary that there's some contingency, that doesn't explain why we got the contingency that we got, why we got these geometry books rather than another set of laws that we might have had. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Let, yeah, let me a few, a few comments on this, right? So, so Hume will specifically say, um, <clears throat> hold on, I, I literally just had it. Yeah, okay. So, Hume will yeah. say there's a chain, right, where there's a succession of objects where each part is caused by that which preceded it and causes that which succeeds it. When then is it difficulty? Says Hume, right? Yeah. <laughs> when he's a, he's a good he's a good writer. Yeah. Hume's always exactly. interesting to read, right? Now, yeah, you know, you know, Hume actually. Hume's style was mocked initially. Like he's, he was Scottish and he, tr he, he had an affected English style to sound like, not like a Hick because Hicks would have been from Scotland. Right. Right. So his treatise got like mocked because it was obviously some backwoods Hick trying to sound English. Anyway, so, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's some funny historical I, context. So, yeah, so yeah. On, t on top of what you just said, when we understand the, and this is where, this is where I don't want to, I don't want to switch streams here because, because you know, Leibniz isn't a Thomist, right? Right. But the Thomists have good resources here because because if, if 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 they have the essence existence distinction and we can say, well, what is the nature of a contingent thing? Well, the nature of a contingent thing is something that just does not carry existence inherently. Right. It's something that always derives existence. Right. It's something that always has to kind of borrow or receive existence from another. Right. Well, if that's the case and the collection of everything is just contingent things then clearly, clearly, like we have the question, how, how did how did existence ever get into that system to begin with if nothing either had it inherently or brought it in, right? right? In which case you would generate the contradiction that nothing would exist under that understanding of contingency. Rose, and, and the interesting thing about Rose's objection, right, is it really would commit you if that, if that law is necessary, that like if you just kind of like, this is one of Alex Bruce's responses, right? Just kind of like pluck out everything until you're down to the last contingent thing and it just happens to be a unicorn. That yeah. it would just be necessary that a unicorn exists, right? And that's just yeah. like completely absurd, right? right? Clearly there's nothing about the nature of a unicorn at all or the nature of any contingent. That's what it means to be contingent, right? There's right. nothing about the nature of this thing that demands it be included in reality because there's, there's nothing about its nature that carries the reason for its existence intrinsic to itself, right? So I think once we once we think deeply about the the points that you made, Jim, not just about the nature of contingency, but also whether certain properties or parts to hold diffusive, we can see contingency is definitely more like color than it is weight. It's something that right. you, you don't you can't just stack contingent things, right? To get to get a, a, exactly. a necessary whole, yep. right, or an independent yep. whole, or something like that. Stat, it's just you can add as many zeros as you want. You're never going to get a one, right? And right. It doesn't matter how you organize them, either, right? Uh, yep. Another good just stock example to help people get the point. I use this in the article that I just had to revise and resubmit on, right? Is you imagine that there's some some moon kind of reflecting light into a bedroom, right? And somebody asks, well, why is why is the the property of illumination in the room, right? And somebody says, well, look, there's, there's a moon reflecting light. And they say, okay, great. But we kind of know moons by nature don't produce light. They only reflect light, right? So how did, how did that property get into this system, right? How is that property there? And somebody says, well, there's another moon. And that's bouncing light off. And you say, okay, great. Well, what about uh, how that how that happened? Well, there's another moon, right? In yep. fact, there's an infinite number of moons, right? But like clearly... Clearly, that isn't an adequate explanation because not like it doesn't matter how many moons you have, right? None of them can account for the causal property that's under consideration if we understand that the nature of a moon is something that can only reflect uh, but never produce light, right? right? So you just kind of so so there would be no light in the system at all unless there's something either within or beyond that system that is inherently light producing or that is just inherently luminous, right? Right switch the relevant things around and hopefully you can see the issue of just trying to move from contingency to necessity without something that is itself categorically different right something that right. is itself metaphysically necessary right no agreed, agreed. yeah mm -hmm. by the way uh, Atom uh aquinas excuse me leibniz makes the essence existence distinction and he cites thomas on it right uh, <laughs> he does he he does have interesting you know makes interesting you know recourse to the scholastics when he needs them yeah yeah right when, <laughs> when they're when they're useful when they're in. useful yeah and so and, and one of the things i think is very important to see like a priority in this text for leibniz is he wants to maintain that the world is 
what he calls, I believe in this text, physically necessary, meaning there is a set of absolute a priori necessary laws governing the, the world, right? Okay, a priori to us, right? Um, or at least a priori to God. Uh, but the world still is what he'll say metaphysically contingent, right? right. And it, that and that's the thing. It's, it's like he wants to say, hey, look, I'm going to give you, like you can have one geometry book inscribing the principles de necessary, necessarily on the next one, and it's all physically necessary within the realm of nature, but that does not tell us that nature is metaphysically necessary. Right, so a, a, a completed physical theory of everything was not only something that wouldn't bother Leibniz, he expected it. He expected it, yeah. He expected exactly. it, right? So yeah. just to get clear on that. Now, look, there's many scientists that think that that just is going to happen now since the quantum revolution and what right. have you, but it's right. – those those considerations are just they're, they're almost sort of irrelevant for the type of yeah, argument yeah, that Leibniz relevant. is yeah. making, right? Yeah, exactly. awesome. All right, wow. So that was a lot just for the first couple sentences. I That's guess all right, man. We, yeah, let's should finish we, that first paragraph. All right. So Leibniz continues. What is true of these books is also true of the different states of the world. For the state which follows is, in a sense, copied from the preceding state, though in accordance with certain laws of change. And so however far back we might go into the previous state, we will never find in those states a complete explanation for why, indeed, there is any world at all and why it is the way it is. So he's looking, yeah. again, not just for why does it exist at all, but why does it have this particular configuration right. that it does? And, Jim, you right. made a good distinction earlier. I just want to highlight it, right? Different uh, – an explanation that is etiological, right, which right. tries to understand how one physical state sort of unfolds or even determines – uh, unfolds into or determines another physical state and an explanation is ontological which is well why are there any physical states at all yep. and those are yep. different questions yeah and then he's going to want what we'll call a deontological <laughs> explanation of why this set of laws rather than another right yeah excellent right. very cool all right uh should we continue or anything Let's else go. you want to keep going highlight on that cool all right people trying to text me here all right uh i certainly grant that you can imagine that the world is eternal However, since you assume only a succession of states, and since no reason for the world can be found in any one of them whatsoever, indeed, assuming as many of them as you like won't in any way help you to find a reason, it is obvious that the reason must be found elsewhere. For in eternal things, even if there is no cause, we must still understand there to be a reason. Yeah, interesting distinction. We'll come back to that. Yeah. In things that persist, the reason is the nature or essence itself, and a series of changeable things, if a priori we imagine it to be eternal, the reason would be the superior strength of certain inclinations, as we shall soon see, where the reasons don't necessitate with absolute or metaphysical necessity, where the contrary implies a contradiction, but incline. From this it follows that even if we assume the eternity of the world, we cannot escape the ultimate and extra mundane reason for things, God. So there we go. We can see him hinting at this deontological explanation yeah. jim mm -hmm. yeah and so what you get that you know i mean we kind of we're done with a lot of stuff we said but the important thing here is he made this distinction between uh a, an explanation in terms of a kind of absolute necessity right he's going to call metaphysical necessity um and an explanation on the other hand an explanation what he call says it inclines without necessitating okay and a, as we'll as this goes on i the way I like to cash this out is Leibniz is making a distinction between can't and won't. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these, these are two different modalities for Leibniz and they're just as sort of, you know, like metaphysically grounded. Right? Yeah. Let's, 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 let's yeah. build on that. Cause I think that's really yeah. good. And I think this is, I think this is, this is true that we can make and should make this distinction. Now, how far we think that should cause us to affirm Leibniz's theodicy, we'll get to that. We'll get to but, that yeah. but think about this. Think about St. Joseph, right? Uh, we can ask, could St. Joseph, and I borrow this actually from Dr. Michael Torrey, who has some good stuff on nature and grace. We can ask, could St. Joseph be an absentee father? Uh, well, yes. yeah, yeah. But would I mean, St. Joseph? Apparently, he considered it, right? <laughs> right. But well, well, actually, wouldn't it be, yeah, actually, it wasn't his kid. So yeah, but 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 yeah. would St. Joseph be an absentee father? Right. No. And the, and when we ask the second question, we say no. But and like and like we very confidently say no. And and the reason we say no is because of his character, yeah. right? His dispositions. So could yes, but that that first could is almost kind of an unimportant question. Right. Yeah. Because the, the more significant thing is wood. Now, since St. Joseph is finite, he could in a in a different way, like a hurricane could take him out or something like that. And he right. could be absentee. But we're kind of asking, like, would he just willfully abandon? Yeah. Right. Um, 
Mary and 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 Jesus. And there we want to say, no, definitely not. He would not do that. Not because he's by some uh, strong notion of necessity for it. It's just no. We just know his character, he right? He just yeah. won't do it, right? Uh -huh. do it. Right. So I think I think that uh, I think that's yeah I think that's a good important thing to get here as as we go is is could and won't are consistent. Yes, there's mm -hmm. things you could do that you just won't do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Now uh, let's take another one, right? Like yeah. this is one Aquinas considers: Could God annihilate the world? Oh, yeah, like yeah. that's certainly within the divine power. But would God ever do it arbitrarily? No, no. he would never do it, right? Because it's not in accord with divine wisdom, right? Right. So there's something about God's character that can give us like 100% confidence, even though God could by his power or in consideration of the power, just like snuff the world out five seconds from now, yep. we can be like 100% confident. Don't have to be like freaking out, you know, <laughs> right. that God just won't do that. Right. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah. or, or if you go to the Nicomachean ethics, you know, Aristotle's perfectly virtuous person, right. Is not deliberating. Right? They're going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly it's, in, in a perfectly good sense within their power not to have right right it, they they are inclined uh but but they're not made to do it yeah yeah excellent good yeah. good yeah good 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 man i knew we were going to have fun with this one yeah we, right. we already are all right should i read the next paragraph do you mind do you mind to do the reading dude i'm, I'm totally cool with this if, if you want me to stop sooner before i finish just yeah. interject because there's excellent. just a lot here all right i'll hit the buzzer <laughs> Yeah. All right. Leibniz continues. Therefore, the reasons for the world lie hidden in something extra mundane, different from the chain of states or from the series of things, the collection of which constitutes the world. And so we must pass from physical or hypothetical necessity, which determines the latter things in the world from the earlier to something which is of absolute or metaphysical necessity, something for which a reason cannot be given. For the present world is physically or hypothetically necessary, but not absolutely or metaphysically necessary. That is, given that it was once such and such, it follows that such and things will arise in the future. Okay, so hold, hold right. yeah. Can I stop you there? This is very important for Leibniz's overall project, right? Because remember, he wants to get the European band back together again, right? Of course he okay. does. Of course he does. So he, he wants Protestants and Catholics back together, right? And he also he wants church and state back together. Mm -hmm. And he wants religion and science back together. He want he he sees himself as this unifying project. What a romantic man he is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and and so so what? Now he, I think you overestimate his ability to pull this off. But um, anyway, there's lots of funny stuff on him on this. But anyway, uh, so what do we get in those that pass right there? He's saying, look, I'm going to give you uh, rationalist physicists, himself included. Okay. Uh, that there is a hypothetical necessity in nature that 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 there's there is no need to bring theological explanation to bear into the proper disciplines of science right like there is a hypothetical necessity operating in nature okay but that doesn't tell me why there's a nature at all or why we got the one that we got right yeah. and so he's saying the the hypothetical necessity that you know galileo you can have that right that right. hypothetical necessity, it's all yours. Yeah, like, okay. given this, I'll give you that you can explain everything else down everything the chain. Else. Yeah, right. given mm -hmm. this, given that we've got the world and we've got the world of this character, and all the explanations are there. So go, man. Go make your great cannonballs that we can, like, knock down walls with that. Okay, great, mm -hmm. right. Okay, Um, but there needs to be a ne metaphysically necessary explanation and a deontologically necessary explanation of that there is anything and that we got the anything that we got. Right. Right. And that's now he's dividing. He said these are a different set of questions entirely. Right. And 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 he's he's kind of preaching a principle of non interference between these two realms now. Yeah. You know, maybe we should speak about sort of the, the nature of explanation in general, Jim. I guess yeah. both of how maybe we think about it and how Leibniz was thinking about it, right? Like to me, I think the best way to think about explanation is really something that removes mystery, right? It's something that removes mystery. And we naturally always instinctively kind of hunt for explanations when we encounter finitude, as Leibniz always, always talked about. I mean, this is Lonergan's great yeah. insight, right? Is like restrictions on being are restrictions on intelligibility, right? They always leave mystery, right? right. And it's and it's that mystery that is pointing beyond those limits for some extrinsic source of intelligibility, something that's going to remove that mystery further, right? Yep. Now, if we're going to kind of make explanations ultimately cash out we're going to have to explain all limits 
which to avoid circularity, you can't do with invoking further limits. So we're going to have to get to something that is in, intrinsically completely intelligible, right? Which means it'll have to be uh, completely unrestricted. Now I'm moving beyond Leibniz to, to Lonergan here, two of my, right. L, two of my favorite L's, right? <laughs> the L guys. Yeah, the, the L bros, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I think it's consistent with kind of what Leibniz is thinking here. And certainly when um, – we're looking at explanations in a very common sense uh, way, right? We do accept like different explanations depending on the type of cause under consideration, right? right. If it's a if it's a physical cause, we we expect physical types of explanations, but that's different than if the cause is an agent cause, where we do accept moral explanations or explanations based on motives, right? Inclinations right. and stuff right. like that. So, I, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to toss out that you know. No, we think, I, I agree. Yeah. And and, and, and what you're what you're giving us there is you know a pluralistic uh, explanatory toolbox, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And that's really what Leibniz is trying to establish here. Okay, mm -hmm. that he's in an environment that has been trying to reduce have, have a reductive explanatory toolbox where we're going to get everything reduced down to basic geometric like uh, etiological explanations, and that's yeah, it. That's mm -hmm. it entirely. And, and think of some of the stuff we talked about recently; it makes a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what he's trying to say is, no, uh, explanation is said in many ways, right? And and even though we have, he thinks, or approaching completed explanations in terms of physical necessity, there's still great big gaping holes are calling for another other kinds of explanation, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Teleological, right? Really, it's teleological he's looking for. And um, and metaphorically necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's one quick line here. He says, uh, we'll have to get something that is absolutely physically, uh, metaphysically necessary. Let me emphasize yeah. that. Metaphysically necessary. Something for which a reason cannot be given. Now, I guess there's two ways you can you can read that. Uh, one is some way I would quibble with it, and another I would not. If you think of reason as an extrinsic causal explanation, that's right, because you're not yeah. going to get an extrinsically causal explanation of metaphysical necessity but i obviously don't think all reasons need to be extrinsically causal explanations yeah. right yeah. um so if that's all he means by reason that we're looking for an extrinsically causal explanation yeah. then that's right uh you're not going to have that type of reason for the for the absolute namely god right however it doesn't to, mean go to the go to the next sentence he's gonna actually take that up right away oh, okay all right sweet yeah. all right sweet yeah. sweet, sweet, sweet. All right. uh, therefore, since the ultimate ground must be in something which is of metaphysical necessity, and since the reason for an existing thing must come from something that actually exists, it follows that there must exist some one entity of metaphysical necessity. That is, there must be an entity whose essence is existence, and therefore something must exist which differs from the plurality of things, which differs from the world, which we have granted and has shown is not of metaphysical necessity. Right. So. Right. Yeah, its so, explanation so, is internal to it, is what he means. It's 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 an it's an intrinsic explanation, right? Yes. It is completely intrinsically intelligible, right? If we could, yeah. if we it, another way to think about it is like if we could c fully comprehend the essence of God, there would be no questions remaining, right? Now we can't. Its, it's essence is, is is its existence, yeah. right? Now we can't yeah. do that from our perspective, yeah. but that's the idea yeah. that this thing exists and is completely intrinsic yeah. it is as Lonergan would say the complete set of answers to the complete set of yeah. questions that can be coherently asked that's how Lonergan and, talks about God's God's essence right and mm -hmm. I think this brings up a really great way to think about what, what he's doing at the mundane level is he's saying look the world's essence is and this, he says actually says explicitly earlier in, in, in on this on this page he says look the the essence of some of of mundane things is explained internally right they are just what they are essentially right and and therefore like the the system of laws in the world doesn't require any further explanation that's just what it is okay but its existence needs an explanation right, right because this existence isn't carried by or identical by its with essence. its essence right uh -huh. yeah mm -hmm. exactly right it, you see, and so right uh, so, Le so Leibniz would be to say, like, why, why does, why is a, a proton attracted to an electron? Well, like, well, that's just well, that's kind what of is. what it is, right? Yeah. It's what it is. But then, if you ask, well, why does it exist? Well, yeah. now we've got another question, right? Uh -huh. Like, why is a proton attracted to an electron? That's a dumb question, right? <laughs> that's what it is. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. um, why are there any protons at all? Different question, right? Mm -hmm. And you can say, well, because there's this other kind of particle, but you haven't really answered it now, right? Because it's the same set of, of essential principles governing the whole thing. So now you need this thing that is outside of all of that and if its essence isn't its existence we have no explanation right right yeah so and, no and, who caused god objections here right, right. And, and and i i just want to emphasize that not obviously not all explanations are efficiently causal or extrinsic 
causal explanations, right? Because if you ask me, well, what's the explanation for why there are no square circles? I'm not going to give you an efficiently causal explanation of that. I'm going to give you right. an explanation by way of, con of contradictions and the impossibility of contradictions right. and stuff like right. that, right? Exactly. So just to show that we, we do need this sort of, uh, I like a, the, 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 the pluralistic toolbox of explanations, yep. right? This yep. is, if we're going to, if we're going to make sense of reality, we have to, to have that, right? Right. All right. So let's see here. Should we do one more paragraphs? I think so. We're, yeah, this is <laughs> we're like this an is, hour in on four paragraphs. This is, is awesome. a, this is a juicy text. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I hope you guys are enjoying this. Yeah. We'll do one more paragraph and then we'll answer whatever questions or comments you guys have. Yep. All right. Furthermore, in order to explain a bit more distinctly how temporal, contingent, or physical truths arise from eternal, essential, or metaphysical truths, we must first acknowledge that since something rather than nothing exists, there is a certain urge for existence, or so to speak, a straining towards existence in possible things, or in possibility or essence itself. In a word, essence in and of itself strives for existence. Therefore, it follows from this that all possibles, that is, Everything that expresses essence or possible reality strive with equal right for existence in proportion to the amount of essence or reality or the degree of perfection they contain for perfection is nothing but the amount of essence. Okay. Really interesting paragraph takes us down yeah. a different turn. That one. Yeah. Well, and he's setting, he's setting up the teleological moral explanation here, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is some heavy Leibniz stuff here. So it, this is his very, very strong notion of the PSR. So Leibniz's notion of the PSR, it, is the weak notion of the PSR is, you know, we need an explanation for all the current facts, right? And the strong notion is we need an explanation for not only all the current facts, but also an explanation for all the non-occurrent facts, right? We have to have an explanation for what is and what is not, mm -hmm. okay? Because, and what he's saying here is, it's is interesting, it's, it, it's an interesting philosophy modality is, to say something's possible is to say that it is it tends to existence okay um and so he thinks if what possibility is is a tendency to be then we need an explanation for why uh something isn't why a possible isn't okay and now think of it so uh you've got a world that ex exists right he thinks he said okay the only way you can explain that is through me metaphysical necessity a metaphysically necessary being okay but now there's a lot of possibilities for uh, what that world could have been, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And he thinks they're all equally good candidates for worldhood, okay? Um, this is it's, They're all equally inclined to be. So now mm -hmm. you need an explanation for why this one rather than all the other ones. Otherwise, you don't have an explanation. And right? uh, Leibniz know. is going to give you give it to you here. Oh, you're going to get it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You're going to get, get it. One. You're going to get it good and hard, right? <laughs> you're you're going to get an unapologetic explanation here. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Do, you, do you see that? So in, in, it's not, I mean, I know a lot of people think this sounds crazy where he's saying like things exist by default. That's not quite what he's saying. What he's saying is, is what possibility means is it could exist. So then all possibilities are equally good candidates, right? The only way you could narrow candidacy for actuality is based on what already is. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but he's, he's not taking what is as a given now, right? Like we're trying to explain why we have what we have. Okay. And right. so he thinks then you need an explanation, not only that there is a world, but why we got this one, then all the other possible worlds that intrinsically in and of themselves are equally good candidates for existence. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And there, and yeah, this is important, right? Because there's, there's many who are following in the tradition addition of Leibniz broadly, who, of course, uh, defend much weaker formulations yeah. of the PSR. But Leibniz yeah. is is quite strong, right? Quite strong. Mm -hmm. Quite strong. Right? Like, yeah. Like, like he would say that there, there has to be an explanation, not only for why my book is on the desk right now, but also, you know, why another one isn't, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Excellent. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good, 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 good. All right. Should we take some comments then? And Definitely. Any questions? Yeah. And by the way, uh, you know, gentle listeners, track down. There's lots of free, even it's a different translation. There's lots of free editions of this of this essay. So please, you know, read ahead a few paragraphs. Be ready to go because we're gonna we're gonna be hitting this again soon. You know, we'll pick it up.
Yeah, Catholic base says, does this mean we will get a treatment of Leibniz's ontological argument? What do you think, Jim? Should we should we dive into that at some point? You know, if we we uh we won't get it in this text, but I mean, I mean, here we go. Like you know us, we're, now we're going to go down a Leibnizian rabbit hole, and we'll we'll, we'll do we'll, we'll we'll get to that at some point, I'm sure. Yeah, I've got a um, it's an old it was a paper that I wrote a while ago, uh, an article, not a not a paper. Um, I'll try and find it, but I think it was. Be- because hold on i'll find it here one second um because natural things possibly have a cause i think was the name of it um i can't find it right now it's on my it's on my sub stack yep. well i i i'm increasingly sympathetic to these new modal ontological arguments in fact i, I just read um nagasawa's book of maximal god and that's that's a pretty interesting read yeah. So I don't know, man. I feel like every six months I go back and forth on these ontological arguments. Yeah, right. So, okay. so yeah. we should we should do we should do at least one yeah. episode. Yeah, um, and and reading a text by Leibniz would be a good good way to engage occasion that. Right. I, my my stance on the ontological argument is actually this: is like you can use the contingency argument to definitively break the stalemated first possibility premise, right? Yeah. That's which what Leibniz gi- does. Yeah. Which gives you the ontologic argument, which gives you the ability, I would argue, to reduce all brute facts to zero at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. Um, so I think the ontologic argument serves a definite useful yeah. purpose. Now, whether it can stand independently of the contingency argument, I still go back and forth on. I, I honestly, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. And remember, I'm a, you know, it's been a while since I looked at my Leibniz, but if I remember right, one version of it he gives, he says, look, if what Descartes missed is he needed a, he needed a premise, and Saint Absalom misses. They need a premise that shows the possibility of God, right? Mm-hmm. And if you have the possibility of God, then he thinks the ontological argument actually follows. Okay, and then when pressed to you know prove the the possibility of God, he uh, he goes ahead and like gives you a first cause argument. Okay, right. Which mm-hmm. okay, which we might okay. Yeah. Which is brilliant. Which has which has limited apologetic value, but that's not the point. He's right. not he's mm-hmm. not actually trying to do apologetics. He's trying to make a point about the nature of God. Okay, because like once again, like Leibniz, um, he thinks once he has the divine perfection, he can then he, he can work from God to perfect world down. Right. Or he can work from perfect world to God up. Right. Right. Like yeah. He, he, and so what he's doing with his ontological argument is he want he's actually trying to do theodicy when he's pulling that thing out. Mm-hmm. Is he wants to argue from the divine perfection to perfection of the world to eliminate the, the theodicy problem. Okay. Um, and also there is another place, uh, I can't remember the text where he tries to give you a possibility um, uh, argument, a, po- a defense of the possibility premise in the ontological argument without giving a first cause argument. And he basically makes an argument and I can't reproduce it is by saying, tries to prove that there is, that it has to be possible that, that, that there is a being that has all, all calm possible properties, right? Mm-hmm, he thinks mm-hmm. that that he can prove that is metaphysically necessary, which would then seem to prove that God is possible. Therefore, God exists as perfect, and then he can then do his theodicy based on that. Right. right. Yeah. Na- Nagasawa, you know, he's interesting because he he just starts by saying, um, God is the maximally consistent set of knowledge power and goodness right yeah, so like yeah. by definition that has to be possible yeah. right so he's got yeah. an interesting move and he leaves open now whether that's omniscience and omnipotence and yeah. how we think about it we leave that open yeah but he tries to kind of short circuit uh you know the stalemate in in that way which i think is interesting by the way i pulled it up on the on the screen here here's here's the formulation i had a while ago uh and yeah i start by possibly there is a cause of all natural and I, by natural i mean uh finite bounded things right mm-hmm. and then you know typical uh, S5 argument. And so it'll give you that uh, God exists in the actual world if you follow that through. And I give a couple different considerations to try and break that possibility premise. But the strongest one um, that I that I argue for in here is just running the contingency argument. I had yeah, I call I call it the runaround argument. That's it, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you run around and it's like, well, what what use is the ontological argument serving at that point? I say, well, it serves other uses, right? Yep. It could, and Jim hinted at some of them, but it can also show that theism can really reduce brute facts to zero in a way right. that uh, no other system can. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I mean, so, and, and, and that's essentially what, so Leibniz thinks you can, you know, like, he does the, much the same thing. What, he, what he's saying is, look, is if God ex- is a per, is, exists and he's perfect, right, 
well, then that would entail that there are no brute facts, right? Because mm -hmm. such a being would do nothing without a sufficient reason, right? Sometimes he argues for the PSR based on the divine perfection. Right. 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 Well, my little PSR paper, which I'm still waiting uh, on, uh, it's it's submitted right now. Um, I, I, waiting on. I I say that, at, or did I, I think I took that section out because people told me it was too busy. That's the, that's the co comment I kind of get. I always try to do too much. But at the end of the article, I said... Um, does what did i say i forget my own work essentially i say like look giving up the psr doesn't necessarily save you because we can still have other arguments for god say these right. modal ontological arguments that allow for brute facts but then once you have god you then have the psr so it can work right. it works the other right. way around right. yeah so I, exactly. I, I i agree with with Leibniz. So, yeah yeah but but we on philosophy for the people are never afraid to do too much Never, <laughs> never, You're never. I've never. always, I've always been too busy. Everything I do, we're guitar, not. writing, yeah, podcast. We yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we are not, we are not constrained by these, I mean, these words. I, I mean, relevant right here. The comment from Brendan says philosophy of people is doing two a day. So here we are yeah. being too busy yeah. once again. Yep. Only for our gentle listeners. Yeah. Um, for the comrades. Vincent says, I missed the Marcuse episode, but a short bit on 24 seven for an upcoming Marxist Monday would be great. Have you read that book, Pat? I have not. Mm -hmm. That's a great little book. Yeah, it, it's a it's it's a it's an easy uh, one time like like single sitting read, and it's a very very good uh, critique of the now along like Marcuse and lines. Yeah, that would be a fun fun one for us yep. too. A friend Duong has a comment. I think this was getting back to the could would distinction. He says, additionally, since God promised that he would spend eternity that we would spend eternity with him, annihilating us, which is logically in his capacity, would lead to him lying, which is metaphysically absurd. So yeah, I mean, like good point, right? Is like, is it is it like broadly considered open to the divine power? Yes. But is it in accord with the divine wisdom, the divine justice, all these other things? No. So in that sense, the more interesting question is the would question, not the could question, right? Uh, Duong says, sounds like SCOTUS' assertion that if something is possible, is necessarily possible. Jim, what do you think uh, Leibniz and SCOTUS have in common? Any thoughts on that? Um, I know I know. in some of the earlier papers, he's he's kind of an admirer of SCOTUS. I think his his, uh, his take on the Eucharist is like highly influenced by SCOTUS, SCOTUS right? Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of true of like, like, a, like a, a Lutheran scholastic like the young Leibniz, you'd not be surprised by that, right? Yeah, excellent. Good stuff. You would be oh. involved in matters Franciscan, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we are over our hour, so we're going to wrap it up here, gentle listeners. Thanks for tuning in for the great comments, as always. This has been a blast. I knew this one would be fun, Jim. And uh, yeah. I know we wanted to try and make it a two-parter, but we didn't make as much progress as we thought we would with the no. So this this one might be a this this one might be a twenty-parter. <laughs> That's all right, man. There's there's no hurry, right? There's no hurry. Uh, <laughs> We'll chip through it. I'm having fun thinking about. I haven't thought about Leibniz in years, right? And, yeah, uh, brilliant, brilliant man. I'm glad we're doing. It. Hey, let me give a quick, uh, quick mention and shout out. Um, first off, guys, again, if you like what we're doing here, please share these videos on Twitter, social media, email them to your grandmother, whatever you want to do. It it all helps. Uh, this new young channel it's growing fast. I think we're already over 400 subscribers, which is pretty cool growth for how um, not long we've been around. So we appreciate your support. Check out our website over at philosophyforthepeople.com. And, of course, if you need your own website, you can head over to magdalenedesignco.com, magdalenedesignco.com. Sarah Bussey, who designed our Philosophy of the People website, will gladly design you your own website that is aesthetically appealing, uh, smart from a marketing perspective. And whether you need it for a business or a dead pet, say a dead iguana, with all due respect, memoriesofbob.com. <laughs> Bob lives. Bob lives.com, right? You just want to flatter Jim? Get him a website made for Bob. Check it out. Magdalene Design Tell Sarah we sent you. She's going to hook you up with some awesome goodness. I mean, just look at how beautiful our philosophy for the people website is, and you'll see it the is good gorgeous. work that she does. It's so gorgeous. thank you all for your support. Gentle listeners, we'll catch you next time. Adios.